for this webinar. We're gonna talk about the important role executive function plays in uh, learning and also how executive function helps explain some of those achievement gaps and how we can use executive function as a tool for equity. Um, so the, here's what we are going to cover today. We're gonna define executive function. We're going to explore the causes of executive function difficulties, explore the role executive function plays in achievement and equity gaps, and then we'll get into teaching executive function in schools. How can we use executive function as a tool to support um, the success of all students? And I'm gonna try to oh, mute people as they come in. Hold on. Sorry, I'm running. All right, cool. Um, so let's keep going. Um, so I'm coming to you from the Research Institute for Learning and Development. So this is a nonprofit out in um, Lexington, Massachusetts, where executive function is like part of everything we do. So we do EF um, as part of our conferences and our trainings and workshops. We have some great conferences coming up, a great one in uh, at Harvard at the end of March. Um, we do trainings throughout the year. We write blogs, we do articles and chapters, everything. Executive function is a vehicle that we have chosen to kind of transform the lives of students with learning differences. A uh, big part of that is based in the work of Dr. Lynn Meltzer. So Dr. Meltzer has been talking about executive function since before it was called executive function. She's done some excellent work um, throughout, uh, you know, some of the great institutions in Massachusetts, Harvard, Tufts, Children's Hospital. She's also written a number of really excellent books about executive function. Personally, I'm a huge fan of what we call the Green Book, um, and you can see it, actually, maybe you can see it behind me. Oh, wait, there it is. See that? That's my executive function Bible. So if you're looking to do some more reading in EF, I highly recommend that. Um, so my name is Michael Gressler, by the way. I guess I should have said that. Um, and I am the director of the SMARTS program. So SMARTS is an executive function webinar, a curriculum, we're hosting a webinar. Um, we offer comprehensive K-12 executive function lesson plans and tools that teachers can use in schools and in clinical settings. And so we're gonna be exploring a lot of kind of the theory and research behind our program. If it's something you're interested in learning more about, um, you will absolutely have a chance to look at some overview materials and lesson plans, et cetera, once the webinar is over. Um, I want to have us take a second to let my co-presenters introduce themselves, if you don't mind. Hi, I'm Rajni Kumar. I'm the Director of Student Services in Robbinsville School District in New Jersey. And I am Christina Medino, and I am the Supervisor of Student Services in the same district. And we are a mighty department of two, servicing mm -hmm. a preschool uh, through 12th grade public school district. And so I'm so happy that um, Rajni and Christina have joined us today. Uh, I've been working with them, I think we said it's been four years now, and we've really done a lot of really interesting work on executive function, really um, not only to serve students who we would think of having EF challenges, but kind of all students. And I really love the work they've done. They've really taught me a lot. So I really appreciate any time I get to work with them. Um, they've also introduced me to the joys of New Jersey. I have such a good time every time I get down there. I really like that. Um, we're going to be presenting with them um, at a conference at Harvard later, which I mentioned. So we're really very, very lucky. And uh, it's also Rajni's birthday tomorrow. So we just had to take a quick second and wish her a happy birthday. Also, happy birthday to my colleague Donna, who is joining us on the webinar as well. So all these wonderful, birthday, wonderful birthdays. Donna. Happy birthday, Donna. So happy birthday to everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. So we're gonna take a second and um, kind of explore what is executive function, right? Because it's very important to make sure we're all speaking the same language before we wade into such a big topic like this. Um, and I'm not going to go, I could go on for this for hours and or days if you wanted. I'm not going to do that. I will give you a link to another webinar where we elaborate a bit more. Um, but we got to really take a second and define what executive function means. Um, if we really get into it, um, if you Google this, you can find many, many different uh, definitions of executive function out there. Actually, I'm going to put a link to a blog post on the different definitions of executive function right here. Um, you'll see there's some famous researchers 
who would say, oh, executive function, um, there's four executive functions, there's seven. Uh, George McCloskey, author of the brief, says there's 39 executive functions. So instead of taking all this time to say, well, what is this verbal working memory, or is it verbal reconstitution, or is it whatever, let's just take a second and think about the large definition of executive function and how it looks in our classes. So the fancy um, definition of executive function handed down to me by Dr. Lynn Meltzer is that executive function is an umbrella term for goal-directed cognitive processes that require students to synthesize and prioritize in order to achieve the desired end result. But as teachers, we're going to take a step back from thinking about, okay, well, which part of the brain is lighting up or this or that, and we're going to focus on these five very concrete areas of behavior that we can see students applying um, in the classroom. And I'll talk through them very quickly, and then I'll give you that link to the webinar to learn more. So I always like to start off with shifting, shifting flexibly, the ability to um, shift approaches, to look at something in another way, to take the way you used to do it and change it based on the changing demands of what you're being asked to do. So students who struggle with shifting will struggle um, to switch up their schedule or as the rules change or to adapt as uh, the demands change from middle school to high school and beyond. Uh, moving on to goal setting, goal setting is really at the heart of executive function. Executive function implies a goal um, by definition. There is an end product, and I understand what it is, and I can sequence the steps. Organizing and prioritizing, that's a common area to bring into executive function. Thinking through what are the categories, what are the steps I need to um, sort through my stuff, to sort through my time and my ideas. Accessing working memory is like the brain's dial-up internet. Um, can I handle the different um, area, the different directions I'm being asked to do, the different pieces of information? And then self-checking and self-monitoring is, are you able to um, keep up with the different tasks that are in front of you? Um, am I wearing the right hat? Am I being a student right now? Am I on task? Versus self-checking, did I do this assignment to completion? So I just so that was the fastest summary of executive function I've ever done, but we're going to get on to some more things. I did put a link into the um, chat that has a YouTube video that has an hour long webinar getting into each of these areas much more deeply. Um, now, in one of my other lives, I work with students. I'm an executive function coach. I got a kid coming in at five. Um, and I asked them, what is executive function, right? Because if we're going to work on it, maybe the kids should know what it means, right? Radical idea. So I asked them, what is executive function? Here are some real quotes that I received from my students. I don't know what it is, but I know I don't have it, okay? How about this one? The stuff that I'm bad at. And finally, it's doing what the teacher says. So too often, executive function is talked about in terms of weakness. So those top two kids were special ed identified. They're going into their own IEP meetings, and there's an executive function goal in the IEP. And what they're taking away from that is, I cannot do this stuff. I am bad at it. But if you think about those executive functions we talked about, goal setting, organizing, self-checking, self-monitoring, those are the secrets to being the fancy professional adults that we all are. So for these kids to say, I can't do it, we're starting behind the eight ball. We're starting from an area of deficit and weakness. And if you look at, so this is another one of Dr. Meltzer's paradigms. This is showing that executive function is really, doesn't happen in a vacuum. The strategies that kids do or do not use are tied into their metacognition, what they know about themselves as students, to their self-concept, their ability to, their belief in their ability to succeed, and their motivation and effort, the amount of kind of willingness they have to persist when things get challenging. So we can't, executive function doesn't happen in a vacuum. We need to think about our students who are struggling with executive function and understand where those challenges are coming from so that we can support them better. So, you know, I like to think of executive function as a strength-based approach. However, we can't deny the fact that we are talking about executive function difficulties. If you're here on this webinar, chances are you know a student or an adult or a whole bunch of students or a whole bunch of adults who have executive function challenges that they're facing. So let's take a second and kind of think about where are those executive function challenges stemming from. So get ready. I'm a master of PowerPoint. Watch this. So why do so many students struggle with executive function? So part of it is just the 
major demands were being asked, they're asking of them. As the demands on the students get higher and higher and higher, they're going to start to feel overwhelmed by all the different things they have to do. And as adults, we have definitely experienced that in our own way. A day when you have too many things to do is a day you're gonna feel drenched, right? And then of course, there's the issue of technology. Technology is radically changing. Pew, pew, look at that. Pew. Uh, technology <laughs> is radically changing the way that uh, students interact with information and what they're being asked to do, and therefore their executive function. Okay. So the result is that students are feeling completely overwhelmed. Their attention is being divided by a tech device every two seconds. Here's mine right here. Um, and so they're going to be, when they're overwhelmed, no matter how quote unquote smart or capable they are, they get stuck. And this is Dr. Meltzer's favorite paradigm for what an executive function challenge looks like, the clogged funnel. We know they're capable. We've seen them do it on their homework or in class discussion, but when it comes time for the test or when they raise their hand, they get blocked, they get stuck. So we need to identify those clogged funnels and think about how to unclog them. Now there's different reasons why that funnel might get clogged. And some of the ones that people are most comfortable with are some of these brain-based reasons, right? Like if your student has ADHD, almost guaranteed that they're going to have an executive function challenge. It's just the way that they're, they struggle to maintain focus. And so doing the sequencing that executive function entails is going to be very challenging. Um, same thing with many learning differences, such as dyslexia. Um, they're such a, a, you know, exposure to trauma, like PTSD, can also really kind of undermine the brain circuitry behind executive function. Same thing with fetal alcohol syndrome or other developmental issues, right? So there are brain-based reasons, but we can't stop there. Um, because there's also a lot of developmental factors at risk as executive function goes on. As you get older, your brain gets fancier and stronger and you get better at executive function. And that is true for all our students, okay? Um, and there are a lot of factors underpinning that. I like to say that's a picture of me as a baby and that's a picture of me now. So I hope you can see the likeness. Um, you know, when we look at the brain as it develops, you can see that the prefrontal cortex is getting more mature as you get older, and it's getting more, you know, um, there's all this, like, act, there's what they call synaptic pruning, where they're, like, taking out brains, you know, uh, pathways in the brain that you're not using, and the axons in your nervous system are getting more efficient at sending signals. So as you get older, your brain is becoming developmentally more mature, and you are getting better at executive function. Now, if you talk to a neuroscientist, they will talk you through what I just did a terrible job of explaining about the synapses and the axial things and the synaptic gap and the white matter versus gray matter. But as educators, we don't really have a lens into our students' brains. We can't see their synapses, but we can see what's going on them around them, okay? And there's two ages um, where the brain really makes those interesting leaps. And I want you to think about what's happening in the context during those ages. So the first age of a major EF leap is early childhood. Um, so three, you know, toddlerhood into early childhood, three to five, three to six. And the second age is the onset of puberty into young adulthood. So 12-ish to 25, 26-ish, depending on, you know, boys are later than girls. If you have ADHD, it's a little developed. So the neuroscientists will tell you all those fancy, fancy things about what's going on in their brain. But think about what's happening in the context during those ages. Um, for young children in early childhood, um, toddlers, right, now they can start to share and play imaginative games with their friends. Now they have new rules to follow. If you spill it, you clean it up. If you break something, you sit in time out for a few minutes, right? So the context demands have gone way up and the tools and strategies around them have gone way up. Uh, same thing with that entry into puberty. Um, now you're in middle school. Now you can take all these different classes. Now you can write essays and study biology. And now you can start to develop your identity totally separate from your family through sports or through youth group or, you know, eventually getting a job and things like that. So the context is introducing all these tremendous opportunities, and that is allowing the brain to grow and develop these tremendous powers. So not saying that neuroscience, neuroscientists have one perspective, but we as educators should focus on the context we're putting our kids in and look at are those creating executive function difficulties or executive function strengths?
right? So this is the zone of proximal development, which says that learning happens where you're developmentally able and matched with strategies and mentors that teach you the strategies you need. If what you're asking your students to do outpaces their ability and you don't help them with any strategies, they're gonna get that clogged funnel. If I ask a nine-year-old to write a 10-page paper, they cannot do that. They're gonna get clogged, they're gonna get blocked. Okay, that's an extreme example, but we ask our students to do things all the time that are not matched by strategies. You know, they get to middle school or high school and we just assume they can clean out their backpacks. We assume that they can handle a schedule from class to class to class, right? So we're asking them to do something that exceeds their abilities. We're creating those clogged funnels, right? So as we support students in their executive function, we need to think about are we creating the best environment for them? And are we creating contexts that nurture the development executive function versus those that undermine the development executive function? So let's take that kind of contextual approach to EF difficulties and think about the role that it plays in um, achievement, achievement gaps, and equity. So when you first think about um, equity and achievement gaps, you know, as working in education, uh, we have students coming with all different levels of need and support. Um, and a lot of what you hear now is about social emotional learning. Um, so how does this fit into that? How does executive function fit into social emotional learning? Well, we know that the people who are, the children who are at risk or adults who are at risk of executive function are really those who, as Michael mentioned, have ADHD, learning challenges, attention challenges, but also those that have had significant trauma in their lives, who may show as um, having ADHD because or ADHD could actually be trauma, um, or who you know may 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 show as having some mental health difficulties. Um, it's also those students that may have come from a different school where they had a different level of expectation, and now they're coming to school where that expectation is much higher, and there's a gap in and where, where they are. Um, it also could be your high achieving students, you know, a lot of times we look at test scores and grades and this, this child is, you know, great and they're prepared for school, but if you really look at it, they have difficulties with their executive function, staying on task, meeting deadlines, and doing a lot of independent um, activities on their own. Um, and sometimes you see this in the stress levels that they have, especially at the high school or when they're ready to graduate to go to college, and it can turn into mental health challenges and issues. One thing that we've learned as we've gone through this, this journey with Michael and Research ILD is that the, these strategies and these skills are good for all students and all teachers. Uh, a lot of times when Christine and I are sitting there talking about what we're doing next, we often say like, we need our staff to learn this because it'll help them as well. So uh, when we relate it back to school, because that's why we're all here, it's, it can hit so many different ways. We all are looking to give our children those essential, essential skills beyond just education and curriculum to make sure that they are independent and ready for college and the, and the greater you know, 21st century world um, with technology and just being able to access anybody anywhere at any time. So one thing this fits well with, we have also, I'm gonna backtrack a little bit, we have also as educators increased our curriculum expectations where a lot of times our curriculum is not develop developmentally appropriate. It's usually higher than we students should be developmentally. So now we're asking students to achieve, right, with the curricula we put in front of them, being independent with doing projects, project-based learning, et cetera. And we're also expecting them to fit our mold of behavior expectations in a school system, whether it's, um, you know, sitting a certain way or having certain emotions in certain ways, or also, again, going to that project-based learning of leadership and teamwork and making the decision-making, setting goals independently so that they can get their research paper in time and make all those benchmarks of the draft and the research and then that final, final um, paper. Um, and it, we also know that there is a link, and I mentioned this before, there is a link to mental health and executive function. If you have mental health issues, you have executive function issues kind of like um, we say a lot that you have to uh, Maslow before you can bloom. You have to hit those needs of a student, whether it's health or mental health or just, you know, being able to be available to learn in order to learn the, the content and doing some of these executive function skills helps your students get there. Uh, and this translates to every area of life. It's not something that is only uh, working for students in school. It translates to home. It translates to being able to go to all their extracurricular activities while maintaining 
their expectations at school, getting ready for college, doing those applications, going to college, living by themselves, doing a job, getting the, you know, being independent and uh, self-regulated and self-starting with their, with their um, college work, et cetera. So it hits a variety of areas. Like I mentioned before, this is something that we know benefits all students, no matter whether you are in special education or uh, the valedictorian of your high school. So research has really shown a lot. So, you know, Rajneet has that kind of boots on the ground experience, but research is really backing this up. You know, executive function, um, all students are vulnerable to executive function difficulties. However, all students benefit from executive function support. So this is a study that um, is from, it was funded by the Chan Zuckerberg Foundation or initiative, and they are doing something, this is an EF and math program, which I'll share the link in a second. And they're looking at, you know, they know executive function is important. They're kind of doing some research on that. So this is a study that looked at the achievement gap um, between students from low income households and high income households on their math skills. Um, and you can see that gap at the beginning. And the achievement gaps are persistent across many different content areas and many different grades. I'm notoriously hard to deal with. So executive functions, strong executive functions, shrank that gap, okay? And showing that as executive function supports can offer even students from you know, vulnerable backgrounds the skills and supports they need to be more successful. Our own research has shown this as well. This was a, um, a control study that we did in a local middle school, um, teaching executive function strategies. Um, and then looking at the effects on different content areas. And you can see the intervention school showed a much higher gain um, in those different content areas. And those gains were even more pronounced um, at our second test after six months, okay? Our research has gone on to show the students who we are most concerned about using strategies um, will report the biggest gains in strategy use. So we're looking at mostly students with identified learning differences and those students uh, experience the biggest uh, jump in strategy use. However, all students, even, you know, gen ed, you know, inclusion students, whatever, are experiencing a boost in strategy use, a boost in effort, and their teachers reporting um, seeing those strategies and the effort they are uh, putting in across different content areas and areas of executive function. Um, so now we've kind of established that executive function is critical. Um, executive function difficulties are potentially widespread. And so if we are going to support the success of all students, we need to teach executive function. Now, how are we going to do that? Well, that's a good question. Let's get into it. So I'm going to just backtrack a little bit about what Michael was saying about the math instruction and the achievement gap. We also look at it as like an access gap. I think the executive function skills um, meet that access gap to support students in getting to where they need to go. It also is, as we look at, you know, being equitable across this. Uh-oh. Um, all right. Hopefully, Rajneet will kind of come back to us in a second. Um, is everyone, can everyone else hear okay? Then we didn't have a lapse in our internet. No? It's looking all right. Um, if someone can just sign into that chat really fast and let me know that you're still with me, that would be great. Reflect on our strategies that be, has become one of our favorite S words um, and really individualizing that so that students know what works best for them. Um, in our department, Rajni and I talk with our staff and our students a lot about meeting kids where they are. Um, and that doesn't matter what grade level they're at, what their backgrounds are, um, how long they've been in district. We really look at, um, at that and we believe that. And so executive function and our work with um, Michael and Research ILD has allowed us to provide teachers tools for their toolbox. So when they see that student struggling to turn work in on time, um, you know, now we have some tools to be able to support those students. Again, we know it's not just for special education students. We have seen the benefits for um, all students. Um, and we'll talk about that in a little while about how we've rolled that out within our own district. Um, but, there is so much value and, and the way that it works is doing it explicitly. And I think Michael's back. Yes, I'm back. Sorry about that. I just want to take okay. a little vacation. No, it's, you know, technology. Um, 
But thank you for continuing on without me. That's I I was not worried. I was like Christina and Rajneet, they got <laughs> back. Um, yeah, and I so two great comments that popped up in there. It used to be taught explicitly. Why did it stop? This idea of explicit instruction has gotten a bad rap in some ways, and we'll talk about ways you can do explicit mm -hmm. instruction in a powerful, engaging way. Um, and yes, can you do it elementary? You absolutely can. One thing was so eye-opening at Robbinsville. We started with middle school, high school, and the middle school teachers were so jazzed up and they were like amped up. They were like high on executive function, which is legal, that's fine. And um, they're like, we're gonna go into elementary school and we're gonna show them what's up. We're gonna bring EF into elementary school. And they went into the elementary school and they're like, wait a minute, there's executive function everywhere. Because if you think about an elementary classroom, think about there's a circle on the floor that says where you sit. And there's a song that you sing that says you write your name on, on one side of the paper. You have to surround those kids with EF because otherwise they won't get out the door with their lunchbox or whatever. But are those kids learning the strategies they need to carry with them to middle school? So in, in elementary school, a lot of it is about building that self-awareness and beginning kids to take ownership of those strategies. Um, so let's keep going on that. And I think this is still, I'm not supposed to be talking right now. We did this already. I did. You did? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Like those three things. And then you did, you talked about this guy? Okay. Yep. yep. So this guy? Nope. nope. Okay, good. Uh, all right. We're back on track. I like that. Um, so if you think about the different things that are in the room, right, we got highlighters, we got index cards, we got all these things. Um, and these are all things that can be strategies, but a lot of times are not strategies. Um, do kids know how to use highlighters? No, no. They highlight everything, right? They hide the whole page. You can't even look at it. Same thing with flashcards. You know, I got this one student, I love him dearly, but he had a test and he made 300 flashcards. That's not strategic. That did not get him the result he wanted. So we need to teach these strategies in a way that are engaging, that build executive function abilities, and that do not, you know, just lead to more of the same. Um, hey, can I just jump yeah, in? Yeah, yeah. Um, and part of that is teaching them the why. So you take out a highlighter and you say you're going to highlight everything. Well, why am I doing that? And that goes back to the whole idea behind executive function of thinking about thinking, right? Self-awareness, building independence. I'm going to do this. I'm going to use my highlighter because it helps me when I need to go do something else. Yeah, so understanding, you know, what is the point of it? How can I use it? What's good for me? That's exactly right. That's the sign of executive function strategy that that kid owns. So this is the pedagogical model behind that explicit instruction. Um, it's not, it's nothing too fancy, but it's very crucial. Taking time to activate, what do students know about this already? How have you used highlighters? How do you read your text? How do you annotate? Modeling the strategy successfully, not expecting that the kids will absorb it or figure it out like magic, allowing them to practice it independently, whether in your classroom and or on their own through homework and making time for reflection. And each one of those stages is absolutely essential to getting those kids to that spot that Rajneet was just describing. Um, so talking about highlighting, so in our SMARTS curriculum um, in the middle school, high school version, we actually have kids highlight, we call it purposeful highlighting, highlighting with perspective in mind. So they read a passage about a house as if they're a real estate agent, looking at all the things a real estate agent cares about. Then they read again as if they're a private investigator, thinking about the different things that might be stolen or might, you know, might make the house safer or not so safe. And that gets them thinking about why am I highlighting? What is the point of the highlighting I'm doing? And we use like a fun activity that's not related to their thing. So we're all laughing and enjoying ourselves. Um, but we're modeling how highlighting can be used strategically. And so one of the ways in which you do the explicit teaching is from that last slide, like Michael just said, you know, teachers may use that lesson to help students identify perspective. Um, but then the way to make it work and transfer is really to embed it within the work um, that's already happening. So um, I believe on the next slide is an actual sample of one of our high school teachers um, who had done the same thing. So modeled explicitly through that lesson of thinking like a real estate agent or um, a burglar and then transferring this. This is a middle school example of um, really looking at the perspective of was farming a good idea from the perspective of farmers and was it a, a good idea from the perspective of hunters gatherers. And you notice in here, not everything is highlighted. Um, and that strategy now becomes useful to students and more meaningful um, in the work that they're already doing. 
And then thinking about, I'm just going to jump in, about how this is helpful for students once they graduate, which is our ultimate goal, right, to prepare students for life after they're with us, is I remember going to college and highlighting every line except for and and the, and here now we're teaching our students how to really hone in on the important information that they need to do, which, you know, in college, again, self-directed, you're just going through the textbooks to learn the information. Yeah. Another, um, another important thing to keep in mind, so, you know, like we said earlier, we're all coming to executive function because we've got some kiddos that we're worried about, but it's not about those worries, it's about preparing them for the future, like Rajneet said. Someday you're going to be in college and you're going to need this stuff. So I'm not teaching this to you because you're bad at it, because you can't do it. It's so you can be an awesome college student and show them. I use highlighters all the time. Here's the script of who's saying what on this PowerPoint. Here's my planner, it's got highlighters all over it, right? These are tools that adults use, so we can model those and help kids kind of see, uh, that's another way to kind of prove that value. Um, now, that reflection piece though. So I go to a lot of schools and I, you know, wow them with these amazing executive function presentations. Everyone's laughing, having a good time. They see purposeful highlighting. They're like, yeah, I could use that tomorrow, no problem. I can use that in honors English. I can use that on a biology lab report, right? Um, and then I say, don't forget reflection. And you go back and a lot of people, who's doing reflection? No one raises their hand. It's an easy step to skip and teacher's most precious commodity is time. However, self-reflection is the key to that long-term improvement that is really at the heart. You know, of course I want kids to use highlighters, but even more, I want them to understand that they need strategies to be successful. And you have to engage in reflection to do that. Remember this model I showed you just a minute ago, activate, model, practice, reflect. Let's say you skip reflection, okay? Activate, model, practice, and it disappears. Students are not going to build that connection between what they did before and what they'll do next time unless we engage them in that reflection, okay? We have to be doing that. Um, there's different ways of doing it. In the um, elementary curriculum, we do what we call a strategy shout out. I think we call it a strategy share in the middle school, high school. But just this idea of getting kids to say, you know, what strategy did you use? And did you like it? Was it helpful? You know, how do you know? Well, you do next time. And having kids talk that way to each other is really transformative. It transforms the culture of the classroom into one that acknowledges the importance of strategy use, and it puts some of the responsibility on the students because you know it's working. You know, I work with mostly middle school, high school, um, and college boys, so they can be a little surly sometimes. I don't know, hope that's not a surprise to anyone. Um, and they'll say things like, I don't like this strategy. It takes too much time. I don't like it. I don't need this. I don't care. Um, but I know it's working when they say, well, I don't like this. Here's my strategy. This strategy is better for me. And that's what we need them to do. And only by getting them to talk and talk to each other are we really going to create that. Um, we also like this idea of strategy reflection sheets. These are just little handouts that you can give at the end of a lesson and beginning of a lesson. Um, and notice this one is like straight up check boxes. It takes no time at all. What's your name? What subject? What did you learn? Uh, what could you use it for? Do you like it or not? And why or why not? So just getting that data point is really powerful. We use it actually for program evaluation. Are we doing a good job? But um, it's a great way to kind of get that student voice in there because if you do not do that, you will not see that long-term growth. We've also encouraged um, some of our staff to think about putting up a strategy wall. So um, when we celebrate strategies that kids are using and that are working, um, we put those up on a wall so that if another student is struggling and hasn't found a strategy that works for he or she, that they've got other things to, to choose from or to try um, to see if that is helpful. And really, the, you know, talking about it um, makes it more meaningful for kids. And so we talk about this idea of collecting data, and it's a daunting task. And like Michael said, um, time it is a precious commodity. So how do we make it easy? But we also know that as educators, it's that assessment information that drives our instruction. So because time is so precious, we want to make sure that are we spending too much time doing something that kids have already mastered, right? And so we're not going to know that unless we start collecting information. If we know that our kids have great study skill strategies, well, then it's more about reminding them and less about the explicit instruction. Um, however, if we've got kids that are still struggling with some of those executive function skills, well, then we might need to do some more explicit instruction or some more, um, you know, individualized um, conferencing and helping students figure out what works best for them. And we can't do that without any of the um, assessment data. And so there's a lot of different ways that we can collect this. And I think Michael hit a couple. 
people. Um, you know, through SMARTS, there are some formal surveys. Um, there's a Metacog and reflection sheets that anytime we teach a strategy, we ask um, our students to reflect of how did that work for me? Because we don't want them using a strategy that doesn't work. So like Michael's student who created 300 flashcards, you know, that wasn't a, that wasn't strategic and it also didn't help. The, you know, the child did not pass that assessment. Um, and a lot of times, you know, we hear from parents, my child studied for hours and still bombed the test. And so a lot of times we didn't really have answers for that. And I think now that we've learned along the way is that, well, the, the strategies that they're using are not effective, okay? And so if they made flashcards, well, then that's not a tool that's helpful to them. Um, you know, we suggest to kids study, which, you know, don't waste your time studying what you already know. And so there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, we can also collect data through work samples, the stuff that we're already doing within our classrooms. Um, conferencing, teacher and student interviews, using formal, more formative and some summative assessments um, to give us some information about how kids are doing, especially when it comes to some of those more um, relevant tasks, such as study skills. Um, or planning for a project. If, you if you're if you working with a student who consistently doesn't turn things in on time, um, we have to go back to what are we really assessing? Are we assessing their ability to um, produce something? Are we assessing their ability um, to be able to prioritize? Or are we assessing content? And I think a lot of times when students end up receiving a zero for an assignment, that grade is correlated or the assignment was correlated to proving knowledge about content and skills rather than the executive function. And a lot of times we end up assessing executive function um, alternatively. And, you know, I, I think that's really important to help us um, in understanding our role and responsibility in teaching these things to kids. So just to jump in on this is when I went to my first research ILD conference in 2016, the one thing well, I took away a lot, which is why we started this work. But the one thing that has stuck with me that I say to any teacher that I um, start the work with is, um, at the end of the conference, I do like, what is the one takeaway you're gonna take away? And uh, Donna said, uh, at the end of the test, ask your student, how did you study for the test? And it could be an extra credit question, it could just be a question for information. If your student does well, then you know that, that strategy of how that student studied works. If the student did not do well, you know that that strategy of how that student study didn't work and now you can work on alternate ways. So that is another way to collect data and to start that work on executive function with your students that is meaningful and will help them progress. Yeah, I mean, it's not a coincidence. If you look at these suggestions on ways of measuring the effectiveness of these data collection tools, almost all of them are tied into how is the student viewing it? You know, that's why grades is at the bottom. I don't want to go straight to their grade. I want them to reflect on that process, to look at the work sample and analyze, are those strategies working? Because really, measuring the impact and measuring the growth of student self-awareness is really hand in hand. Absolutely. Um, okay, so now we've kind of talked about some of the best practices. We're going to spend some time, since we have some um, amazing administrators with us, to think about, well, where does this live in a school? So now I've got this idea that, yes, executive function is so important, it's so powerful, and we want to put it into a school, where are we going to put it, okay? Um, so we like this idea of these different tiers of executive function support. Um, starting at the top, those are students who we know are very prone to EF challenges, right? These are students who have identified executive function weaknesses, so they're going to require more support, maybe one-on-one -on -one or a small group. We're going to move into academic context with a high executive function demand. There are some things we ask kids to do that maxes out the EF of all our kids. Research papers, project-based learning, transition years, standardized testing. And then finally, we have to be responsible for how the structures and systems of the school also put demands on our kids and our own executive function. So let's walk through each one of those tiers. So when we first started this work, we did start at tier three. It was um, one of the first areas that we really started to notice these struggles, I would go to IEP meetings um, and parents would say, hey, my child can't do this at home. And the teachers were saying, but they seem to get it at school. And my teachers were at a loss what to do. So coming out of the research ILD conference, I knew that this was, this was what was missing. So we started work with research ILD and we started first by training special education teacher, teachers who were going to do this in specialized classes, almost selective classes, sometimes taking a place for another, um, a win period, which is what I need period, et cetera. And they just taught 
the executive function curriculum. Um, we then turn key to our academic support teachers and uh, some of our ELL teachers. Um, and we did a PLC around it so that teachers who were just interested in it would come because we know that if you get student teachers interested, they share the information and get other teachers on board, et cetera. Um, and now we're at the point where we know that this is good for everybody. We're going to start rolling this out into general education classrooms and start to infuse it within our curriculum and our everyday work with students. Um, so here are just a few. So that's not a that's a very common way for schools to kind of bring in EF originally into those, you know, an EF class specifically, or taking academic resource rooms, which are unfortunately a lot of times notoriously lack of curriculum. Um, bringing that in there. Also, you know, there's nothing wrong with giving kids time to do homework in school. Some of my kids, that's the only time they do homework. However, if they're struggling academically, giving them unstructured time to do homework may not be the most uh, helpful. So structuring that homework support, weaving it into those areas where the students with the highest identified needs are coming. Um, so I'm going to do the middle tier and then we'll get back to the um, Robbinsville for the bottom. So another place to bring EF in or to for the next step is to think about where are the academic contexts maxing out all of our students, okay? Um, so like I said, transition years, sixth grade, ninth grade, those are a lot of years where we lose a lot of our students. We're saying, I hate school, I can't do it, I'm not good at it anymore. A lot of that is definitely due to the increased EF demands and the lack of EF support. Um, Project-based learning, I do love it, but it is often goes off the rails, and to me that is because of the executive function components. Um, standardized testing, uh, notorious, you know, hard to teach, and a lot of EF stuff that goes unaddressed. So when we're bringing EF into one of those areas, we're teaming a lot of those support staff with the content support and trying to deliver those strategies in a way that everyone gets the strategy that they need. An uh, example for this one is our work with Excellence for All initiative in the Boston Public Schools. It's a wonderful initiative. I'm not, I'm going to give you all these links at the end because I'm afraid I'm going to like crash it again. So you'll get a link to this. I encourage you to check it out. Um, and basically they're saying we want kids in, you know, these schools um, where these kids are vulnerable for, you know, school failure. Instead, we want to empower them up to be taking honors courses in high school. And we're going to start early. We're going to start in third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, um, into middle school. And we're we're going to have them do a capstone, a two month long multidisciplinary um, community based problem solving project where they do a presentation at a showcase. So wonderful goals, super ambitious, EF coming up here for nine year olds. So we came in and we created an executive function implementation guide. Basically, we wove EF strategies into every step of that capstone. So as kids started planning their capstone and thinking through the steps, they had strategies. As they were doing the work, as they were researching and taking notes and organizing and practicing, they were using strategies. And then we, of course, built in that phase to reflect. So the student could not just think about what did I learn in this capstone, but what strategies worked for me that I can carry with me as I move into later years. So this is a fantastic example of executive function that reaches across the school a bit more broadly um, because of an identified need. And so um, in Robbinsville, we took um, a little bit of a different approach, um, but still infusing it into the work that we're already doing. So um, like Rajneet said, when we first brought this to district about four years ago, we really tapped um, the people who were interested interested, the people who saw a need for it, the people who were invested in this. And while primarily it was middle and high school, um, geared more for middle and high school teachers, we did have some elementary staff who took some risks and said, we can modify this and we can bring it down. Um, and so what we did is we really used those staff members as our resources. So as we rolled out more and more, um, we sort of leveraged them. And so over the years, it's transformed a little bit. Um, but this summer, we used some of those staff members to um, help us really create a framework from preschool through 12th grade. What do we value? What do we want our kids to do? And where, um, what skills do we feel like they need to possess in order to transition successfully from um, building to building? Um, and so this is just a, a small piece. Um, but this is our pre-K to second grade. And what we did is we identified, Michael, correct me if I'm wrong, eight or nine um, priority areas. So you see the four reading comprehension, studying for tests, estimating time, organizing writing. We're also looking at um, self-regulation, managing time. Um, and basically what we did, it's not overly comprehensive, but we said 
Okay, from preschool to second grade, what are the things that kids need to be able to do? What are those priorities in terms of reading comprehension? And then we transfer that, what does it look like in grades three through five in terms of reading comprehension? And then six through eight and then nine to 12. And um, if we had this whole thing up here, you'd be able to see that it really is scaffolded and some of it overlaps. Um, but we also realize that we have to explicitly teach some of these prerequisite skills before they can, you know, create their own planner to complete a project. Um, and so what we did is we've then um, helped them identify, these are our outcomes. How can you infuse this in the work that you're already doing? What are the academic tasks that happen throughout your day where this would be a natural way to infuse it? Um, we've helped them identify, and really they've helped us identify as well, what are the challenges um, for that student? What are What is going to be difficult for them to do when we're considering this priority area? And then where in the curriculum can they find the work to be able to do this explicit teaching? Um, what we have done this year, um, we are currently piloting with about 20 of our staff members, um, K-12, looking at um, extensions. So one of the things, again, we go back to time, we realize time is a priority. Um, how do we find the time to build this into our everyday work? And so what we're challenging our group of teachers right now who are piloting um, this program and infusing this more in general education is, can I carve out 15 or 20 minutes of my time um, and connect the executive function skill to the work I'm doing? So we're calling these extensions. Um, the, the nice part, um, is that a lot of our teachers are taking this and creating their own extension. So while we've tried to set them up for success, they are really finding um, the places where they can have autonomy and create this and really see the value in this. And so our sort of plan is that we're gonna continue this um, and hopefully get some more teachers to buy in next year um, and to be able to just really naturally infuse these skills within the work that we're already doing within our curriculum and within our day. So the outcomes um, tie right back to state standards and curriculum so that teachers see the direct connection of where they can infuse it. So we're sort of taking that um, research away from them that they can just look at this and say, okay, I know how this fits in. I'm, I know how to put this in my lesson plan. Yeah, this is really a thing of beauty. I mean, this is, uh, I love this document so much. I mean, it's creating this expectation that we all as a district own executive function and responsible for these outcomes for our kids and then giving the teachers a chance to grow it and nurture it and develop it themselves i mean uh, robbinsville so good <laughs> okay let's keep going we got one more little piece and then we'll open it up for questions so how do you bring this into your district is the key um there again we took two we sort of took two different approaches at different times, but the key for both, starting both, whether it was through special education and specialized instruction, or bringing this to the whole district through general education, was identifying the, the area of need. At first, the area of need came out of anecdotal data that we were having when we were going to IEP meetings. We were working with parents, and that's where it started. And then when we decided to roll this out to general education, we did a needs assessment survey um, that we sent out to all of our staff and we got quite um, a mix of responses of different um, content areas, different job responsibilities. So it was really nice to, to see a, a bigger picture of how everybody sort of sees this in whatever role that they work in the district. Um, from then there, we knew we needed to buy, get teacher buy-in. So when we started, our teacher buy-in was through some PD. We did a book, a book club with Lynn Meltzer's promoting EF in the Classroom book. Um, we did uh, the PLCs, so the, we got teacher buy-in from our special ed staff, and then also those students, as Christina mentioned, teachers that were interested in it. And then to get teacher buy-in for this general education pilot that we started this year, we did a video. We videoed students and teachers who had already been doing this work in our executive function classes. Um, and the teachers talked about the growth that they had seen in the students and the students talked about the growth and they had seen in themselves and being able to complete work in doing you know what they needed to do to be successful in school and manage their time with sports and extra curriculars. Um, that went over really well. We did that at a PD day where all staff watched this video um, to learn more about executive function and Michael did do um, just a quick intro into what executive function is. So then we decided 
Um, okay, so we have these teachers interested in this pilot. What does that mean? We have this framework with extensions, but we don't want them to do everything that's overwhelming. So we set a goal of saying, okay, we're going to do a certain number of extensions. I think it was three to five every month or by a December. Like around then, we were saying as our goal. And a lot of our teachers have exceeded that. Um, that way it was manageable. We also decided to bring in executive function coaches in each building to support the teachers in doing this work because it can be daunting bringing in something new into the classroom. And these executive function coaches are teachers that have been, have been doing executive function from the beginning. So for four years now, they've been doing this work. Um, so again, we wanted our teachers to use this in the classroom, but taking those, you know, baby steps, right? Start slowly and build up from it. And we actually probably set our goal lower than we should have because our teachers are all exceeding it, which is wonderful. The biggest piece of all of this is that this is not another initiative. It is shifting your mindset. And going back to the idea of equity, equity is a mindset. And so this just supports that mindset that you are now working with students that come with all different levels of abilities and needs and how are we getting them to where they are well we're, we executive function is one way to support everybody in that way um so it's and it's what we've learned and so it's not only shifting mindsets for students or even mindsets of teachers and what they need to teach it's shifting the mindset of teachers in their own executive function skills and also their perceptions of their students so there are surveys that teachers can do where it's students doing surveys and teachers doing surveys. And you get to compare what the student and the teacher sees about that student um, personally and from the teacher's perspective. And we, we found that when our teachers and students were doing this, a student would think, oh yeah, I'm great at all EF because they hadn't actually explicitly been taught it yet. And the teacher saw them very differently. Um, and so that shifts the mindset of the teacher of like, okay, maybe I'm not seeing the student as lazy, which we don't like to use that word, or, un, or unmotivated, but really they're having struggles with some executive function skills, which is m making them seem that way. So then their mind just, mindset started to shift from one of a deficit model with students to one of an asset model, and okay, here are some other skills I can give the student to succeed. Awesome. awesome. Um, so, so, sorry, it's a little sorry. All right. Okay. All right. So we're going to take a second, a few minutes for questions. Um, so if you have some questions that are kind of burning up, um, feel free to type those into the group chat. Um, we will honor time. So we got like six minutes. We'll probably stop there. I am going to, first of all, put up my email. So there it is. Um, I love talking about executive function. If we don't get to a question or you wake up in the middle of the night with a new question, um, please reach out. Don't hesitate. Uh, we love talking about EF, we know whether or not the SMARTS program is for you. We could talk about executive function all day long. So do, don't be strangers. I also did put up the email of my colleague, Kim Davis. She does a lot of our planning and logistic work um, with Boston, with a lot of schools. So she's a great, another great person um, to chat with. Let me, um, I'm gonna paste the link for the webinar evaluation as you get your questions ready. Let me put that in the chat. Um, if you fill out the evaluation, that's how I can send you a certificate. If you're interested in seeing um, either the secondary and or the um, elementary curriculum and a free lesson, you can fill that out. I can send you more information about our organization or some of those amazing conferences that um, Christina and Rajneet mentioned. Um, but otherwise, all right, so type in those questions or I'm just gonna start talking because I get to talk about executive function all day. <laughs> All right, so while so I'm hoping that one or two people will type those questions in to stop me, but another thing I want to mention about this um, needs assessment that we're doing at Robbinsville. So, you know, we saw some really interesting uh, gaps, and those gaps really kind of explain some of those EF challenges that we saw earlier. If you have, you know, pre-K to 2 saying, I always teach strategies for time estimation, and then middle school, you know, and high school saying, no, we don't teach strategies for time estimation, Think about what's changed. You know, of course you might teach a kid who's three or four how to estimate, you know, a minute or, you know, you gotta use timers to schedule how much you clean your class or whatever. But if a student in high school is not learning how to estimate the time it takes them to read a 30 page textbook chapter and then switch to their French homework and then make it on time to their sports practice, you know, the strategies we saw were diminishing as the complexity of the task went way up. 
And as we analyze that with these special ed teachers who are truly wonderful, they saw that those EF, the EF skills in pre-K were really the seedling of what they needed in high school, but it wasn't going to just kind of flourish on its own. We had to create that scaffold throughout, and that's been really um, excellent. It's really been, you know, the genesis of it was, you know, we do these presentations and people will say to us, well, what should a seven-year-old be able to do? What should a 17-year-old be able to do? And so I said, you know, I can't tell you that. I can only tell you you need to trace the expectations of your context. And that's what we started to do in Robbinsville. And we're tracing those expectations and putting strategies behind them. And it's a really, really beautiful thing. Um, yeah, I can't wait to share some more of that stuff at the Learning Differences Conference at Harvard. Uh, I'm gonna share it with some of the colleagues here. I'm gonna go back to Robbinsville and celebrate with them. It's really been <laughs> great work. It's really wonderful work. Um, no questions burning up, huh? People see the chat, you see that evaluation form? I hope so. Um, all right, well, Christina and Rajni, do you have any last words for our audience? And then we will, oh, wait, we got one more. Oh, yes, parents. So Joan, oh, hi, Joan. So Joan is a teacher who helped us pilot our elementary curriculum. She's an excellent executive function teacher. I'm so glad you joined us today. Um, so parents, so how can you involve parents to encourage generalization? That's an awesome, awesome question. Um, any thoughts on that? So we um, have presented about executive function at State of the Schools, which is an annual event that our Board of Ed puts on where parents come out and see a lot of different initiatives that we're doing. We've done some parent workshops around it. Um, something that, you know, we're still on our journey, something that we are working on is that communication from school to home about what are the skills that we're working on in school that you can carry over to home. So that's still something that we're working on, but we definitely have given that information out to parents about what it is that we're doing, why we're doing it. Um, we also talked a little bit about a board meeting presentation. So we've done a few different areas. Yeah, and we, I, like Rajneet said, I think this is an ongoing um, process for us. Um, Michael has come out and presented to our parents, which was well attended, um, but we also know it's not hitting everybody. Um, and so some of our elementary teachers, um, were reflecting in this, um, you know, just yesterday, and we were talking about how do we help parents understand the value. And some of our elementary teachers are saying, you know, we want to assign homework of like help with a chore at home, whether that's you know setting the dinner table or walking the dog, to build some of those um, home to school transitions and vice versa. Um, and so I think that that's still sort of a challenge that we have. Um, we've talked about you know potentially doing some. Um, like newsletters um, so that parents know what we're doing so that they can naturally provide opportunities for kids at home um, even if it's you know have you grabbed all your materials to head to school today or you know we're going to soccer practice do you have you know everything that you need before we leave and putting some ownership there yep. um, it's helping them to, to bridge that and I think that that's still a little bit of a struggle for us but definitely at the forefront Yep. I have a third grade son who probably does not like that I know so much about executive function because every day we talk about like, did you bring home your book? Did you bring home your folder? Did you bring home your log? Did you bring home your homework? And some days he's like, no, I didn't. I'm like, this is your job. This is your responsibility. We put a little checklist on his folder. We put one on his desk. So um, it's definitely something that you can carry over. And we want our, our parents to carry it over because, again, that's just like, you know, it's just so important for, for all content and all subjects. And I yeah. think the one piece that we, and I don't mean to interrupt you, but I just think, you know, it's some last parting thoughts, and we didn't really talk about this, is that while we built um, this system of supports for our kids, we also go back to, to meeting them where they are. So our teachers are not teaching all nine priority areas. Our teachers are not, um, you know, responsible for doing all of that work in one year. Um, we know that we see kids coming to us with different challenges, and so we have supported teachers that if you see kids with organizational needs, then focus on organization. If we're seeing students struggle or as content becomes more specialized as the grades go up, you know, if you're an English teacher, maybe you're working on some reading comprehension skills and some thinking flexibly and some, or some cognitive flexibility. Um, and so this is, the curriculum as well as our framework is really meant to be a guide for teachers to be able to meet students where they are, ultimately um, closing that gap. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's actually a pretty good um, spot to kind of wrap it up on because 
those, you know, how empowering teachers and empowering parents is, is really, you know, it's two sides of the same coin. And that gap, by the way, so those contexts that we talk about that create EF difficulties can just as easily happen at home as they happen at school. But one of the easiest ways is to make those things transparent so that kids understand the EF strategies that surround them at home, they understand them at school, they understand that they're going to be responsible for those things. And that's the wonderful work that Robbinsville is doing. That's the work that I encourage you all to do. How can you make those strategies visible to kids and how can you help them learn to create their own? So I am going to kind of stop it there so everyone can go about their day, whether you're freezing your butt off in Maine or you're lucky enough to be in California, sipping the pina colada probably, um, even though it's like 3 p.m. there. Um, you know, but don't be a stranger. The evaluation form is in the chat room. I will send it out as an email to all of you as well, just in case you didn't get it. Um, you can, you'll hear from us by Friday with whatever you want, your certificate or this or that. We hope to see you in person at a conference or whatever, um, or by email. Don't be strangers. Thank you guys so much for joining us. We love executive